What's up everyone? I'm back on the property again to get some work done. For those of you just tuning in, I'm here in the high desert of California building a farm from scratch, mostly by myself. I am going to be building a approximately one acre fruit and vegetable farm modeled largely after a lot of the standard market garden farms that you see uh, online nowadays. I have uh, a well of which I've installed a solar well pump. Uh, check my past videos about uh, that whole install. Um, I'm going to be building the entire farm off grid. It's going to be all solar powered, solar for the uh, well pump and irrigation. Uh, I'm going to be building a metal um, garage carport thing with uh, for my kind of post harvest uh, vegetable wash area with a walk-in cooler also powered off of solar and uh, so really the only um, uh, deviation from the norm as far as uh, market gardens go that i'm doing here is i'm going to be incorporating a lot more perennials and fruit trees than you commonly see in a lot of the um, annual high rotation market farms that you see um, and I'm going to be using an alley cropping style uh, layout where I have field blocks standard 100 foot long 40 feet wide 10 beds 10 30 inch beds per block separated by uh, rows of fruit trees both for aesthetics and uh, for wind break because it is pretty windy here in the high desert so in my past uh, last video i was uh, planting uh, some of my first fruit trees here and up until now i have just been clearing all the brush by hand with a pickaxe which uh, i have quickly realized is not going to work uh, in the long run so i have arranged to borrow a tractor and i'm going to clear all of it with the tractor, kind of just push all the brush into a corner and deal with it later. Um, I had been trying to do it by hand uh, just for cost and simplicity reasons, but it's just taking way too long. Uh, it has probably taken me a combined two weeks to clear maybe not even a quarter acre of the total acre that I need to get cleared here, as well as um, uh, as a clear brush, I am able to see that the ground is not quite as smooth or level as I would like it to be. Um, my land is not flat. Um, it, it slopes downhill slightly, maybe at a 1% grade or so, uh, and that's not a problem, but there are these kind of wavy undulations in the soil you know, maybe six inch to a foot or so high in certain spots. And I really want it to all be level, especially in the tree rows, because once they're planted out and mulched and everything like that, I can't go back in and level a spot out. If it's in a field block, you know, I'm gonna be continually cropping those out and replanting them. I would have an, uh, periodic opportunities going forward to level out spots if I didn't quite catch something, um, but due to the um, permanent nature of the tree rows, I really want those to be nice and smooth and relatively level uh, as far as I can get. And it's just uh, taking way too much time and effort by hand. So I'm going to be switching to using a tractor. In my next video, I'll be covering that um, in about two weeks. I'm uh, going to be uh, borrowing the tractor. <clears throat> so I've just been up here doing some work. I had my tractor guy come in with his big tractor yesterday. And he was pulling out some boulders for me out of uh, what is going to be one of the field blocks. I had mentioned in a previous video I could see these fairly large boulders, uh, impossible to use by hand, uh, move by hand, you know, some of them probably 800 pounds a piece. Um, fortunately, uh, everyone that I pointed out to him that I could easily see and that we removed, the big tractor was able to do it no problem at all and uh, thus far it does not look like I'm going to have any really large rocks that I would have to break up to move. Uh, there are a couple rocks um, kind of back in where my post-harvest uh, 
area, parking lot, uh, infrastructure area is going to be that I've left for aesthetic reasons uh, and also because they're so large I don't quite know how I would go about moving them even if I wanted to. Um, there's one big rock up in this tree row and actually when I was measuring things out and staking things out I positioned the tree row to actually be on the rock uh, because it's not really a problem for me in a tree row but of course that would be a huge problem in a field block. Um, so um, yeah so I had tractor in here yesterday pulling some rocks out um, I have spent uh, some time clearing more brush by hand just because I have some free time and I'm up here anyways. I did clear uh, my most uh, southernmost um, tree row or at least about half of it and completely cleared it this time to really verify that uh, everything was pretty smooth and there were no waves in the uh, average grade. Um, and this particular row uh, was quite smooth and I don't need to wait for the tractor to smooth it out before I plant it out. So I have eight more um, planting spots opened up um, that I'm going to be planting uh, today. Uh, yesterday I pulled my um, tape measure out, uh, measured out, staked out where the uh, spots are going to be. I raked out little uh, dirt dishes, filled them with water to start softening it. I'm going to be using my broad fork again, which I'm going to be using for all of the tree planting. It's just a really great way of loosening up uh, the hole. And yeah, so I actually on this trip brought up um, 26 uh, bare root fruit trees. Um, I have, uh, I'll, I'll do, I'll talk in a minute about um, kind of my variety selection strategy for picking um, uh, what I will think would be the best varieties for growing in this particular climate. A couple uh, aspects about this climate that would make me not want to go with kind of your more standard um, plain vanilla varieties of various different types of fruit. Anyways, um, so I've got some apples and some pears and stuff uh, that I'm going to be planting today. So uh, yeah, let's move on to that. Okay, so this is the tree row that I'm going to be planting out. I've got eight spots open on this one, uh, just like my other tree rows, 15 foot spacing between the trees. This particular row is actually going to be uh, about twice as long as it currently is. So this is going, this is uh, currently spans one field block in length here. I'm going to have another field block kind of behind my broad fork there. So I'm going to have another eight trees, but like I was saying previously, I'm going to be using the tractor to clear all the brush going forward and uh, down there is also one of the spots where I need to do some leveling with the tractor so I couldn't really do it by hand. I cleared this spot by hand and it just so happened to be pretty darn smooth and flat so I'm taking the opportunity to get some trees in the ground. The other trees that I have here I'm going to hill in which is a technique where you basically just dig a trench lay the trees on their side all together, cover them up with some dirt uh, and water them in, and it just kind of keeps them uh, alive until I can plant them. But given the temperatures up here right now in the winter, they will probably stay dormant, and I'll be up here in about two weeks to plant some more, so they'll be fine on their own. So I've got uh, 26 trees with me right now. I'm gonna put eight in the ground. Uh, like I said in my previous video, I'm really trying to go for kind of some randomness in the, um, the, the way in which I'm laying out the trees. I'm not like, for instance, doing like an apple row, then a peach row, then uh, a pear row, etc. Um, I, I just want uh, any time that a tree needs a pollinator with it, uh, I will be planting it next to uh, one of its own. Uh, so for instance, I'm going to do two apples and two pears here together for pollination purposes. But anything that's described as self-fruitful and in the description, I will probably do a single and next to a completely different species. So on this row, I think I'm going to go mimosa right here, which is one of my... Um, 
kind of pioneer species, nitrogen fixing, just pollinator, attractor, fast growing plants that I'm using. Uh, so I will go mimosa, apple, apple, pear, pear, uh, then I think nectarine, and then uh, I haven't decided on the end yet, but uh, yeah, so. 15 foot spacing, I pulled this tape out yesterday, put the stakes in the ground where the um, trees were gonna go, and then I raked out a little dish so it will hold some water. I watered them in yesterday, water sunk in overnight, came back here, just broad forked it, loosened up the holes, uh, watered them again, pulled the tape again, put the stakes back so I got a nice straight row very consistent spacing and yeah this is basically the format that I'm using for all of the tree rows um, what I am going to do so pretty much every row is going to be this format 15 foot spacing 15 foot width I am going to be planting some walnuts which are obviously a much larger tree that are recommended to be like a 35 or 40 foot spacing and um, I will show in the future my Google SketchUp drawing for the layout of the farm here. Um, there's kind of this, uh, there's this large uh, ditch that runs through my property here. Um, it kind of has dictated the layout a little bit. Anyways, I'm going to have one little area back over here where I am going to do more or less a traditional food forest. It's not going to have any... Uh, veggies in between and I'm going to incorporate the walnuts and maybe um, maybe some other full-size fruit trees and maybe some other nut trees anything that's going to get really big and just won't work with my 15 foot width 15 foot in uh, row spacing for the uh, the alley crop uh, rows so yeah uh, so these are all ready to plant out and I will uh, go grab the trees and start putting them in the ground Okay, uh, my camera card filled up yesterday when I was planting this mimosa, so that's, I uh, can't really use that. Um, but I'm here today, I'm going to plant the remaining seven trees that I have spots for. I thought I would talk a little bit about my fruit tree selection strategy. I might have touched on this a little bit <clears throat> on my previous vlog where I planted my first 20 trees, but... Um, so here in the high desert, one of the kind of characteristics of the climate uh, is that uh, you get really big temperature swings on a daily level, on a seasonal level, and even on a, a year to year basis. So within a day, it gets it can get very hot in the daytime and cool off significantly at night compared to lower elevations in different areas. So for instance, in the summer, it could be 105, 110 in the daytime, and it could cool off to 70 degrees at night. Uh, in the winter here, <clears throat> like for instance, there is still uh, some ice here in this hole uh, that froze yesterday after I had uh, watered it in. It's like 9.30 in the morning here. It's a pretty comfortable 65 degrees probably, uh, but it was obviously below 32 uh, just a few hours ago for that to freeze. <clears throat> so, and then, uh, so that's daily, um, seasonally from, you know, the summers are very hot, the winters are very cold. I'm technically in zone eight here, which would be, an average uh, low of 10 to 20 degrees, though I have heard reports, neighbors have told me that they've seen as low as zero. So <clears throat> one thing that's important when selecting uh, fruit tree varieties is that uh, when it comes to like total hardiness and like the potential for dieback due to uh, freezing, they really care the tree cares about the absolute low that it will ever see. It doesn't care about the average. So even though I'm technically average zone eight here, I could see an average, or I, I could see a, a momentary dip into like a zone seven or a zone six low, which would be zero degrees, maybe slightly below zero degrees. <clears throat> 
So throughout uh, my selection of all the fruit tree varieties I'm going to be growing, I'm kind of trying to hedge my fruit tree portfolio towards a little bit of climate uncertainty and um, just not being on the very edge of you know being hardy or appropriate for this climate here i really want to be want something that is well within the margins for any potential uh, temperature variations that i could have here so <clears throat> um, most uh, almost all of the trees that i'm going to be planting here are dave wilson nursery trees they are, at least here in California, one of, if not the largest uh, wholesaler of fruit trees to all the smaller nurseries. I believe that's true through even most of the United States. Um, at least uh, it seems to me like they're the most common. They have a really great website and they have a whole bunch of different varieties and they also have a, a selection tool for uh, selecting for the late blooming varieties. So here in the high desert we have the risk of kind of late frosts coming into spring. Things can start warming up and it can feel like okay winter is over, things are warming up uh, and then it can get really cold for a period of time. Frost can happen in April, May-ish and that can freeze off your uh, fruit blossoms and basically kill your fruit crop for the year. The tree is fine, it keeps uh, putting on vegetative growth, but your, your crop is lost. So for just about every single fruit tree that I've picked here, I'm uh, selecting a late blooming variety. And on Dave Wilson's uh, site, you can select for late blooming varieties and uh, everything that I've gotten from them at least is in that list. And then I have just gone through that list, looked at, uh, read the little descriptions on them. Um, you know, a cup, you know, if something sounds particularly good, I'll go with that. Also, if it has any little uh, comments about being good for, uh, a harsh climate or a hot hot summer you know that that's another characteristic of where I am here in the high desert um, I will go with those types of varieties so um, and then so for most of the fruit tree varieties uh, I don't actually don't need to worry so much about total hardiness and the risk of dieback you know, these uh, apples, pears, nectarines, peaches, apricots um, are all very hardy trees. They can be grown very far north from where I am, northern U.S. into Canada, seeing much lower extremes of temperature than I will ever see here. Uh, you know, hardy down to a zone four or five, maybe even a three. Uh, so that's not really an issue um, for those particular species. Um, two species that I'm going to be growing, pomegranates and figs, are a little bit on the edge of um, it just being too cold here, at least for the more standard typical varieties. So for pomegranates and figs, I am selecting what is at least described as the most cold tolerant varieties that I can find. So for pomegranates, that's going to be a, a Russian variety and this variety called AC Sweet, which described by Dave Wilson is the most cold hardy pomegranate that they offer supposedly developed in salt lake city which if true is perfect because i'm not it's not as cold here as salt lake city maybe similar but they're farther north and a little bit higher than i am here so uh, and then for figs again most figs are going to be described as hardy to like a zone eight to nine which, like I was just saying, uh, I'm technically zone 8, but they, when it comes to total hardiness and risk of dieback, you know, you could have a tree that's doing great for a couple years, you get that one couple days where you dip into a zone 7 or a zone 6, you know, 10 degrees, 5 degrees, 0 degrees, and you'll get massive dieback or it will kill the tree entirely. So for figs, 
I'm going for um, Chicago Hardy is at least described online as being the hardiest uh, fig variety supposedly good down to like a zone five or six um, and then I've got a couple others Desert King is one that I have experience with uh, eating uh, it's a really great fig described as being particularly cold uh, tolerant um, so yeah that's basically my the way in which I've gone about choosing the fruit tree varieties that I'm going to be growing here. And so for uh, apples, so these next two holes that I'm going to be planting are um, Arkansas Black Spur Apple and Liberty Apple. And those are both uh, supposedly late blooming. Um, they apparently, I think, are semi self fertile but benefit from having a, another pollinator. So. In this instance, I'm going to be planting them next to each other. And then uh, I've got some more trees laid out behind me. And uh, I won't bore you guys with showing planting every single tree because it's basically going to be the same method for everything. I have my seaweed uh, extract and mycorrhizal fungi inoculant. I mix that up with some water. Everything is getting a root dip before it goes in the hole, staked, taped. And yeah, that's pretty much the format for everything. Um, I had, uh, you know, I pulled the tape measure back through after loosening up the holes, put the stakes dead center where I want the uh, trunk of the trees to go, and yeah. That looks pretty good there. Okay, so like I said in my previous video, I'm using uh, MycoGrow, which is the mycorrhizal inoculant offered by uh, Fungi Perfecti or Fungi.com, which is Paul Stamets brand. There's a bunch of different <clears throat> mycorrhizal inoculants available. This is Maxi Crop seaweed extract, which is pretty common. So the idea here is I'm just trying to give them a little boost on planting. Um, the mycorrhizal being kind of the more important inoculant because 
hypothetically it will uh, give some benefits to the tree as they begin to root out. dunk into the hole it goes I started to explain yesterday when I was recording the mimosa planting these are my uh, first bare root trees that I have uh, planted here up until now, everything has been in a number five container, you know, traditionally potted. Um, <clears throat> due to the varieties that I've been choosing here, all these late blooming varieties and stuff like that, uh, it has been a little difficult for me to find the varieties that I want. So I've had to get some mail order. I've had to drive around to a bunch of different nurseries uh, I've also been buying them a little off season here because it's still it's early February now Most of the nurseries don't start shipping until now ish um, But I will say I do like the uh, bare roots. They're really easy to transport They are bigger uh, in comparison to the number fives um, which is nice. Uh, hypothetically, they'll establish faster because they have a little more vigor in them. I've seen some debate online about which is better to plant. Some people claim the bare roots establish faster because they're not really bound up and used to being in that container. Um, and for the most part, just about everything else that I'm going to be planting is going to be bare root. I've got quite a bit of uh, mail order trees coming. I got these from Bay Laurel Nursery uh, up in Atascadero, California. They're a big mail order um, spot, but I was able to come by and pick them up and save on shipping. So, <clears throat> yeah, I like them. They're, like I said, very easy to transport. Okay, that looks great, and uh, everything's getting a stake. Uh, the only thing with the bare roots I have noticed is they don't have that instant stability of being, you know, a heavy number five root ball in a hole. So, like this could just very easily be tipped over because it just doesn't have much root mass there in the hole. Uh, but it's not leafed out, and not it's going to be so lightly pushed by the wind. For now so um, but these especially definitely need the stake I think and I will probably come through and upsize these stakes these are just what I have right now these are actually like a I got them at Home Depot and they're for I think more like grading stuff um, so I might get like a little heavier uh, diameter dowels maybe a little taller and put them a little deeper because I think the tree should at least have stakes for Probably at least a year um, because we, we do get high winds here for sure and I really don't want any blowing over uh, when they're leafed out and they're getting pushed a lot harder because they have a lot more surface area.
Okay, that one's done. I uh, won't film the rest of them because they're all going to be exactly the same here, but I'll shoot a couple clips when I'm done here and talk a little bit more about uh, my layout and my uh, design here. Okay, I got all eight trees in the ground. Went uh, pretty easy and pretty quickly. I did them all the same. They all have the uh, single stake, three or four bands of the green tape. I watered them in, raked a little bit of a dirt dish at the base of them for future watering and yeah went smoothly maybe took me an hour this is one thing i really love about fruit trees and perennials it's just such a small initial time investment and you just get years and years of production and good tasting fruit off of them so uh yeah like i mentioned before i'm planning on having about a hundred fruit trees give or take about 10% of them are going to be the uh, pioneer trees, the mesquites, the mimosas, and the Siberian pea shrubs. And yeah, I'm kind of keeping with my random ordering of the trees here. So at the end I have a mimosa. I have two apples of two different varieties, Arkansas Black Spur and Liberty Apple, apple for cross-pollination. I have a... Uh, Craig's Crimson Cherry here. This is one, actually I believe the only late blooming sweet cherry variety that I could find. Most of the sour cherries are late blooming, but for whatever reason it seems like the sweet cherries are all on average early blooming. But this is one of the Dave Wilson trees that's uh, uh, late blooming. And then I've got an Arctic Glow White Nectarine here. Uh, supposed to be self-fertile, late blooming, so I planted it on its own. And then I have two pears here, a Bosque pear and a Barlet pear. The bar Barlet uh, apparently is like the quote-unquote world's most common pear. Uh, they need a cross-pollinator, so I planted them together here. And then at the end I have another Chinese apricot, which is self-fertile, supposed to be late blooming, good for late frosts. Uh, I also have one more over here that I planted in my first batch of 20 trees and I think I have one or two more coming and uh, those will be planted out uh, in the rest of the tree rows. So uh, I'll uh, in a future video elaborate a little bit more on the layout and show my Google SketchUp drawing and stuff, but uh, so I'm going to have one field block right here between these two rows. And then I will have it boxed off by a north uh, running tree row. And then another field block here, um, bordered on all four sides by the 15 by 15 uh, tree row. So yeah, feels really good to get some trees in the ground. Uh, the continuation of this row right here is going to require the tractor and pretty much everything i'm not really going to get any more planting done until i get the tractor in here in a couple weeks and uh, get all the brush cleared stuff leveled out there's just uh, like i was explaining before when uh, when there's six inches to a foot of uh, dirt to be moved uh, it's just way too much work by hand and the tractor is just so fast and efficient at it so I'm going to be waiting on the tractor for uh, uh, future planting, but uh, within a month or so, I plan to have basically the entire layout of the farm completely cleared, leveled, staked, corners marked with my rebar and caps, and most of my trees in the ground probably by the end of the month or within a month from now, which will be uh mid-march which is good timing for uh you know springtime and stuff starting to leaf out uh, like i think i touched on uh, in an earlier clip over here due to this ditch that runs through my property which i will talk about in the future i'm having to kind of lay things out around it and i will have a little bit of a more proper food forest uh, over here where i'm going to put some of my walnut trees and maybe a couple other larger trees that don't really aren't going to fit the 15 by 15 format of the fruit tree rows the uh, walnuts are 35 uh, foot spacing recommended so yeah i'm uh, going to take a break now and uh, 
So I've been, for this uh, tree row that I cleared by hand, I piled all the brush over to the side here. There, I, when I say I'm gonna get the tractor in here to clear everything, it's really just because I'm on a little bit of a time crunch to get both my trees planted out for spring and my field blocks cleared for planting my spring and summer cover crops to start building my soil fertility. The, I mean, ultimately, I guess if I had the time, uh, I would probably do at least the brush removal by hand because it's very clean and precise. And I have just the brush, you know, has been picked out just by the crown with my pick and laid over to the side here. And when I go to chip it, there's no dirt or rocks in it and it just creates a really nice mulch. When I get the tractor in here, the tractor ultimately scrapes up a bunch of dirt along with the brush when it, uh, and then I'm gonna basically just end up with these dirt brush piles kind of on the outskirts of the farm layout, uh, which will, I, I, it, it's essentially just buying me time. I'll have to deal with those later. It will be a little bit more inconvenient than what I have here where I have just pure nice uh, brush to go into the chipper. Um, but uh, just given the, the time that it takes to do this, I really just am opting to do it with the tractor. Just this tree row alone more or less took me three days or so to completely clear and to smooth out and everything. But since I have this nice clean brush here and I am liking the at least small initial little bit of mulch around the base of the trees, I'm going to fire up the chipper this afternoon and try to at least mulch in these new trees that I planted here. And yeah, so check back in this afternoon. Okay, I was able to mulch four of the newly planted trees. One thing with the wood chipper, I love the utility of being able to turn brush into a very fine, high quality mulch that I have already seen the benefit of as far as moisture retention and I'm sure I will see later benefit of soil biology moving closer to the actual surface of the soil, etc. cetera. Uh, but one thing is it's not very pleasant to run and operate. It's really loud, it creates a ton of dust, so I have to wear a respirator, and I even have these uh, safety glasses that make a full seal around my face, because in the past I've just gotten a bunch of sand and grit in my eyes, and then you're like huffing exhausted, depending on which way the breeze is blowing. So probably my least favorite uh, task to do at the moment, but I do love the result. It looks great, it functions well, and at least for the purposes of mulching the immediate area around the trees for establishment, I am, I'm planning on uh, importing a bunch of wood chips from local tree trimmers and ultimately mulching all of the tree rows in a nice thick layer of wood chips, uh, you know, full width, the full 15 foot width of the uh, tree rows. But for now, given the resources that I have and the fact that I'm wanting to recycle this brush that I have as opposed to haul it to the dump, um, I, I like the wood chipper for that. But uh, it's also just time consuming. I mean, it was, I don't know, 45 minutes or so just to mulch those trees. I mean, it took me longer to chip that little bit of brush and create the mulch than it was to actually plant the trees. So that's, it's also very time consuming. But uh, it's, you know, eight of a hundred trees planted just this afternoon. And um, it's a relatively fast process as far as the the, the total time in which I'm going to have these trees of benefit to me and will be producing uh, a crop that I can eat and sell. So 
it's I'm not complaining as far as the amount of work that goes into it. I know that the annual vegetables and the the row crops are going to be way more labor intensive than these ever will be. Once these are planted and growing once or twice annual pruning uh, sticks will run through that wood chipper a lot easier than the brush does so for for that it will I'll probably very much like having the chipper um, these the trees are going to be incredibly low maintenance in comparison to the vegetable growing anyways uh, I'm kind of tidying up stuff here I'm headed home tomorrow uh, I'll be back in a week and uh, be doing another video um, these are the remaining trees that I have uh, from the order that I picked up recently. These are the ones I wasn't able to get in the ground uh, today. Uh, I've got a bunch, I've got like four more um, apples, uh, some more tart cherries. I've got my four walnut trees here, which are the much larger stalks and ultimately going to be much larger trees and a couple nectarines, another mimosa, and uh, stuff like that. So since these are bare roots and um, I need to keep them alive, I read online that the best technique for kind of temporary homeostasis and storage of bare roots until you can get around to planting them is called hilling in, which is where you basically just dig a trench and uh, um, lay the trees on their side with all the roots in the ditch, cover them up with soil and water them and as long as they're kept moist um, they'll kind of stay dormant. Temperatures hopefully here unless we get like a very odd warming uh, period are still gonna stay uh, they're gonna stay dormant because the you know it's freezing at night they're not gonna leaf out I don't think. Uh, so at least I mean it, and it's gonna be uh, a couple weeks at max until I can get these in the ground so they should be fine so what I'm gonna do here I soaked them in a, in a little bit of water just to give them a little bit of a chance to absorb absorb some moisture and yeah so I'm just gonna cover them up with a bunch of soil and make sure they're moist and they'll be here for me in a week or so. Okay, that's gonna be it for this video. I'll be back in a week and I've got that tractor lined up to borrow. I'm gonna get uh, all of my brush cleared, all the field blocks cleared, um, everything leveled out. I'll be planting some more trees. I'm gonna be finally starting on my fence, get a, a gas auger for the corner posts and a gas driver for the T-post for the line posts. I'll also be talking a little bit more about my soil fertility plan. I got my soil test back. I just took a water sample to send off to a lab. Um, I had taken a uh, water sample previously and was planning on sending it to the lab that I sent my soil test to, but I realized they really only kind of do an irrigation um, tailored water sample and since this is going to be a homestead ultimately I wanted a more comprehensive lab report for uh, drinking quality and stuff like that. So yeah thanks for watching give me a comment uh, and I'll see you on the next one.